The computer says no. That's often the way that users think about desktop virtualization. That's why we're talking today about delivering the appropriate virtual desktop, because maybe one day we will get to a state where users that have to experience desktop virtualization will say, thank you very much, instead of, what have you done to my desktop? That's the idea anyway. Let's see how far we can get along to it this morning. And uh, so, as you know, I'm Tim Phillips for The Register. Uh, but today we've got uh, a couple of people who know a lot about trying to make users happy. Let's see if they actually succeed. Uh, first of all, from Microsoft, Matt McSpirit. Hello, Matt. Welcome Hello. to our studio. Matt, it must, be, it must be a depressing sort of job to have to deal with desktop virtualization at Microsoft because everyone always complains and whinges and stuff. You'd much, be, you'd much rather be working for Xbox. Xbox would be nice, yeah. I'd love to, uh, to work for Xbox, but I think the desktop space is, is very exciting. A lot of, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of cool technology coming out. So. Well, it's definitely, there's definitely discussion about that. We'll be having some of that discussion uh, here, and, and uh, we'll be trying to sort out some of these problems. Also, with the help of Ding Ding All Aboard, it's Andy Vass from Freeform Dynamics. Hello, Andy. Welcome back to the studio. Good morning, Tim. I'm not going to make you blow up any inflatables or anything like that today, because this is quite hard enough, isn't it? I was so looking forward to that this morning. You really weren't, actually. Now, uh, just before we get going, reminder that uh, there is that little tab for asking questions. Ask questions on some stuff. We're going to get quite specific today and look at scenarios of desktop virtualization and what you should be doing. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get into some stuff that's really relevant to you. If we're missing that, ask about it and um, I'll put the questions to the guys here and we'll see what we can sort out for you. Give us your feedback afterwards. You can download the slides, have a look at them as a PDF, uh, entertain yourself on the train. Um, and, uh, but let's get on with it and let's have a look at uh, what, the, what the fundamental question about this is. This is what we boil down from. The, the user experience is vital but we don't optimise it. So what's sub optimal, Matt, what, you know, what, what are they finding that's irritating them? I think from a, from a user perspective, it's moving things away from them into the data center environment for, for a virtualized desktop. In, it almost includes certain kind of caveats around performance, around speed, around responsiveness, and I think that's what the kind of feedback that we're getting from users is, you know what, it's just not rich enough for me, and, and it was fine before, it worked, it was, it was acceptable, and you've taken it away supposedly for a better life, and now it's, it's actually not performing as well. Better life for the IT department, not a better life Ideally, for them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. Andy, what sort of things are they missing then? What are they, what are they getting taken away from them? Well, it's things like just the whole PC experience. So can you print? If it's complex to do that, then it makes you like a misery sometimes. Can you plug in a USB peripheral, or can you do that Skype chat that you were looking to do? So it's just the natural way of using a PC. And if it's fundamentally different to your normal experience, it's just a difficult way to work and adjust and encourages users really to think of alternative ways to get things done. You know, and it's not surprising that they're miserable if, you've taken away, if you take away their Skype and their ability to print and tell them they can't plug in their USB thing, which has got all their stuff or on it. Or watch YouTube. Yeah, or watch YouTube. I, I mean, just basically stuff like this, which isn't actually fatal for the business, is mm -hmm. it, sometimes? Sometimes it's just this is quite reasonable for them to expect this. So we're, we're going to talk about giving them some of that stuff back, perhaps. It's like having yeah. a sense of personal space and, yeah. and your own private area to, to work and think. Mm. Okay, well, let's have a, let's have a look at how, we, uh, how we're dealing with that problem at the moment. And these are some of the bad things that uh, occur that you've pulled out. So, you know, it, it, we just say to them, you're going to have to put up with it. You work for us. Uh, is, that the, is that the way that a lot of IT departments are dealing with this at the moment, Matt? I think it's, it's a little bit unfair on the IT team to, to kind of for them to say, yep, yeah, that's the hard line, it has to be that way. I think successful deployments of this kind of technology is where IT works with the user to define just what the, the common ground is and just where that middle line lies. You, know, you want to be able to do this, we'd like to give you it, but it's difficult, we'll meet in the middle somewhere. And I think having that relationship between IT and the end users and doing the proper analysis, it, it really does help to scope the project more with the user in mind and, and the user feels valued and not like you're taking things away from them, I think. That's a user rebellion, Andy Buss. That sounds very romantic, so dramatic. You know, but uh, what does it mean? They, I mean, they've got to cooperate. It's their desktop. Well, they, they do, but again, it's about what they need to do to be effective in their job. Mm -hmm. And these are very personal. If we remember the mobile phone, suddenly what made them very popular way back when was things like clip-on phone covers to personalise the look, ringtones to personalise the, the sound. So people treat their 
their desktop PC or their notebook or whatever computing environment they've got, um, in general, as their own personal customizable space. They like to put photos on, possibly play music, consume media as well as do work. Mm. They like icons to be customized so that it's familiar to go to to do work and be able to copy and paste between applications without having something get in the way of, of doing it. So the experience and, and the actual feel of ownership is, is vital for them. And in fact, one of the big problems we see in desktop management and why it's difficult to do effectively in many organizations, even if it's not virtualized, is the fact that users don't want the feeling of IT having total control mm -hmm. over their, their workspace and environment and changing things without their, their permission or... It, do, it doesn't seem unreasonable to me if, for example, you're, you're saying that they find it hard to copy and paste between applications mm -hmm. to say, I'm sorry, that's because we're in complete control now. It's not really an answer that's going to make them want to cooperate. No, they'll have no confidence in IT either. They'll, they'll just feel that they're, they are being controlled, their PC's being controlled, so therefore they are being controlled and, and they might not like that feeling and the yeah. rebellion might start. So. And uh, we've got this law of unintended... I, I'm assuming the law of unintended consequences isn't a real law. There's no one going to get sent to prison or anything like this. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe if we did incarcerate a few more users, then it would simplify things a little bit. Mm. But, you know, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're doing today. This law is the general law. What is the law of unintended consequences? So it's really about secondary effects that you don't always think of when you start off on a, a project. So... Sometimes it's, well, let's virtualize the desktop. That sounds like a good idea to get management under control. And suddenly you realize the network's overloaded with traffic that you didn't have to carry before. The storage system suddenly has massive demands on it to hold the images that you're doing. And enterprise storage is a lot more expensive than cheap desktop storage in terms of performance and reliability. So suddenly there's costs maybe you haven't thought of. And also way changes of usage model. So... If you are rolling out a virtual desktop infrastructure, are you actually encouraging users to do a behavior you don't intend because you're restricting the, the type of applications or, or ways they can work? Uh, that's very often the problem, isn't it, Matt, that you get um, putting these virtual desktops into place. You're creating something that doesn't adapt or move very easily. You've created this one environment that's mm. fixed. Yeah, and for IT, that's that's a, a bit of a nirvana because they know how it should look every day. It looks the same, and that's great. But 18 but, months down the line, it's not looking so clever. Yeah, and the, the user just feels that restriction, and, they, and it's not flexible enough for, for the way they work because maybe they haven't been consulted as part of the process and you know, the relevant kind of environment gathering information hasn't been... Hasn't so been we're piling fulfilled. up the problems. You've got to dig us out of in the next, what, the next 50-odd minutes, so you better be on your game. There's, uh, uh, one of the questions early on has said, we want to make sure that uh, we know how to um, how to look at what users need and identify mm -hmm. those needs effectively and practically because uh, at least one of our viewers is having a, a big problem at doing that. So that's another thing for you to yeah, do as well. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good one. So there's, there's um, a lot of tools and a lot of different ways you mm -hmm. can analyze the users, but Microsoft's actually released a guide uh, called the Infrastructure Planning Design Guide, which is free to download, and it's a set of questions that you can use as the IT team to ask around uh, about your environment so it helps you understand what the types of users are what type of uh, what type of applications they're using what kind of requirements they have and build up a model and it's by no means perfect but it certainly gets you on the right track to ask the right questions so then you can base your technology decisions we'll discuss on that information so it's quite useful right that's good and we're, we're going on so you can download that but don't get into reading it just yet because we've no. got the technology some of the technology decisions you're going to have to make coming up as well and they're just important um, okay, um, Andy, first of all, let's have a look at what the reg readers have told us about some of their problems with getting the appropriate desktop in place. Uh, and the first one is this, uh, the uh, reasons not to adopt desktop virtualization users right up there. Absolutely, and this comes from a survey we run really towards the back end of last year, so very up-to-date and uh, mm -hmm. very much the opinions of the reg readership. And what we're being told really is that cost, that perennial issue, is, is top of the list. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, this is a big impact on virtualization because we've got to think of the long-term value proposition and ROI behind the investment. And it's not cheap, is it? Yeah, it's not something just to run into because you think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. You actually have to think about uh, things on a lot of different levels. So there's not a one-size-fits-all yeah. solution, for example. So what works for a, say, a call center worker is unlikely to work for a high-end engineer or creative design professional and then on the other hand you've got all sorts of things like are you duplicating the equipment in the data center do you actually have space in the data center 
for example. So it's a lot of planning. And then you've got to think about some intangibles that come back to the, the business. So things like the value of flexibility of working from home or, or mobile, hot desking, can you save on real estate by doing this? These are all sorts of things that may not be in the IT budget, but as a business can, can be the very valuable. The business is expecting them. They're built into the way that the business is moving. Yeah, and it's the way the business would like to work, and it's mm. a way to solve those needs. But those benefits need to be factored into the costs and the, the return that you get from deploying the solution. So costs is a big issue that we find, and making that case is often the most difficult step mm -hmm. on the road to, to virtualization. But look at those users as well. Uh, I see you know, more than half the cases then users is a problem. Absolutely. It's, it's cultural resistance, it's expectations. Those expectations may be unreasonable as well, so how do you manage the expectations mm -hmm. to get people realizing, well, what type of device can you work with? What performance should I actually be expecting? And, and, and that involves working with them, as we've said before, about mm -hmm. how they want to work and making sure that you, you're engaging with them. But we know from long experience and um, talking to uh, various readers and uh, CIOs, etc., that often the biggest cause of an IT project failure is a lack of consultation with users and a rejection of uh, the applications or the project and a, an unwillingness to work with it. Should we be asking users what they want more, Matt? I mean, they're likely to come back with, we want everything we've already had. Yeah, and then that's going back to what I said before around finding that middle ground. You know, IT is trying to push the business forward and, and move it away from being a cost center to being a, something that enables the users to work more effectively. And newer modern technology can do that. So you've got to find that middle ground where the user wants this, we can deliver it through these technologies, can we meet in the middle and... and and, and provide it in a cost-effective way with the good return that, that meets their needs and what IT want to achieve. What matters on that is keeping your promises, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And uh, okay, let, let's. Uh, you know, and there's also on this graph. I suppose on this graph, the most important bit is the little tiny bars at the bottom, isn't it, Andy? It is, and I think it, it shows that to a large degree, a lot of the virtualization projects that have been going in have had an altruistic nature to them. So they've really been focused around benefits to IT, for example. So is it easier to manage? Can you centralize it? Uh, is it easier to patch, for example? Not, mm. can we make users happier? Are they more productive? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if we look there, it's, it's actually by far, in a way, the, 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 the least beneficial of moving to, to a virtual desktop type uh, solution is the actual user productivity. Yeah. And when you factor in that staff cost is often one of the biggest uh, costs yeah. of an ongoing operations of a business, if you're not taking into account the productivity, and in some cases making productivity worse, is yeah. it a benefit to the business to, to move to virtualization? Mm. It's easy to look at this and just decide that if you're outside the IT department, Matt, the, the virtual desktop's a terrible idea by the look of this. Yeah, but if you're outside the IT department, you may not have the knowledge about the benefit it can bring. So it's, it's again, it's working with them to establish that knowledge and, and the, the benefit we can put in by, by rolling out a virtualized or remote working type environment. Sure. Now, it's um, the uh, agree or disagree. What's the, uh, the, the blockers and the problems here? Well, really what we're looking at is some of the, the resistance, why yeah. users don't want to move to a virtual solution. Yeah. And I think part of it is this whole user experience. Yeah. People today are very familiar with technology. Yeah. Consumer PCs are of a very high standard, and often they're quicker to upgrade to latest technologies than an enterprise is. So they're expecting a full, rich Windows 7, for example, experience, because that's what the, the fairly recent PC in the home might well be having. That's what they've got at home, yeah. yeah. And they come in and suddenly you've got an environment where you can't print, you can't save your files to a predictable part of the file system. Mm -hmm. You may not even have access to your application if the network isn't there. So the experience is decidedly different to what they're used to, from the instant um, service that they get on a, a desktop to suddenly having maybe an environment that the graphics is very bare, they can't mm -hmm. install applications, they may not be able to use Flash, they may not have media and uh, suddenly it's a whole different way of working and they feel very restricted. So it's not you know, so much where do you want to go today as, as in you're going to go where we tell you to go today. That's how it will feel to a user, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, now uh, why are we worried about what age that um, our uh, hardware is when we replace it, Andy? Well, there's two things really, one of which is sort of we tend to have a lot of older PCs floating around the organizations mm -hmm. these days. And to make use of them for on modern applications, virtualization is one way 
to do so. And that we can see in sort of the mainstream PC usage. But on the other hand, we've also got different types of users which we can see in, in the notebook and also demanding users. And these guys have up-to-date performance type PCs. They're replaced uh, when we look at the figures every two to three years. And again, they're looking at having a, a rich experience on these devices and they're expecting to do so. If you then start to take away from that on a fairly modern platform, it's defeating the object of really providing them with modern up-to-date equipment. Mm. So we've got those two ends, make use of old equipment as best possible, but also make sure that new equipment's being used to its full extent. Now, uh, does new equipment, uh, if you're looking at new processors and you're looking at the, the, the new hardware that we've got, what specifically can that add to desktop virtualization as an experience? So with desktop virtualization, a lot of kind of um, uh, media types, so things like Flash and the like, are starting to be redirected to the end client device. So if you've got a more powerful thin client, for example, than, you, than what you classify as a traditional one, mm -hmm. When you're running a high-end virtual desktop, with you're running YouTube and HD content, a lot of that is getting redirected and rendered here because it's a better user experience. But without that, if you've got that high-powered device, not power consumption, high power, but performance, then what you'll find is you can have that richer user experience than if you were redirecting to a, an older, perhaps less powerful, thin client device. So it's the newer processes and capabilities we're starting to see is, is to take that into account. It's one of the things when we sit here and we talk about server virtualization, Matt, one of the things that we often talk about is giving new life for old servers. Mm -hmm. It's not such an easy thing to say that we're giving new life to old PCs here, is it? That doesn't really follow. And some of that, you'll save money because you don't have to spend money on upgrading your hardware. Mm. That's not really, uh, that doesn't really hold when we're talking about any kind of demanding user. No, I think, I think the demanding user is, is going to be a, a specific use case, but they can still benefit from desktop virtualization uh, in terms of both their applications, the way their desktop is provisioned, as long as we give them the power user, user status that they've learned to demand locally. If we gave them a virtual desktop and it just didn't do what it needed to for them, whether it was poor or whether it was uh, not acceptable at all, then that's where it's going to fall down. You know, and, I think right. yeah. and I think just to come back to that point as well is often server virtualization is about taking older servers and being able to consolidate all those workloads onto fewer newer ones. And we wouldn't accept, say, a virtualized server if it gave 50% of the required service performance. Yeah, exactly. And yet often on the desktop, we're taking away maybe a, a significant element of the experience through the virtualization if it's not thought through correctly. So it's about making sure we deliver what's required. OK, just so a couple more graphs, and then we get through, when we're going to get into your thinking through, and we're going to break this down into how exactly we do uh, make this work for people. So it's, uh, oh, uh, I've gone on two there. Let's uh, get to this one. Now that's, um, tell me that. There we go. The dedicated thin, uh, dedicated thin client, and the you know, and the PC running a thin client. That's how we imagine the client is. But at the bottom here, you've got smartphones and things like that. Do we really want virtualized desktops on smartphones, Andy? Well, this is what the users are, are telling us today. The demand is, is say less than the traditional ones, mm. but they're seeing still twenty five percent of our there. users saying that that's. And in fact, what we're seeing today in, in one of our recent surveys is, in fact, the the smartphone is now being given out to employees more than the old traditional just voice only mobile phone. So the smartphone is becoming a, a key element in how people communicate. Mm. They're doing email and web browsing, and in the future they'll be wanting certain applications. And unless there's a native one, virtualization is one of the ways to provide apps down to them, for example, so users can be productive. But on the other hand, we're seeing a full spectrum of, of use cases. So we are seeing more and more that PCs on the, the desktop can support application streaming. So you can have a full PC plus some virtualized applications. Or you can run a, a full thin client app on a PC, uh, as long as you can make use of local resources, for example. Mm -hmm. And not only that, we're also seeing because they're virtualization capable, you can actually pump down sort of a, a virtual image to run on the machine if need be as well. So a whole new range of solutions coming out, which means we've got more choice as to, to how we architect the solutions. Uh, Matt, do we really have to produce virtualization solutions to, for all of these devices? Sounds like a lot of work. Uh, I think the key thing you said there is solutions. So the virtual desktop on a, on, a, on a smartphone would be, would be quite difficult to use. And if we're talking about the importance of user experience, whilst mm. I could 
interact with it, it would be relatively small. It, and like, it seems like a very hard way to yeah, do something. Yeah, it would be. It's me going into my virtual desktop on my smartphone and opening an email client and then typing an email, is it not easier just to use my local email client as part of my smartphone? If you had really tiny fingers. Yeah, yeah or right. a massive phone. Yeah. Um, the slates and tablets, I think, opens it up a little bit more because they're lightweight, they're the next big thing and, and you know the, the coolest thing on the street and people want to be able to use them. And I think... As you get to closer to the top of that list, the thin client, the PC running a thin client type OS, and the full PC, they're where we can achieve the highest levels of user ex experience and acceptance. Um, I think the other two are mainly a nice to have to allow people to be flexible. Would your advice be to most of our viewers to say concentrate on those top two or three and forget the others for now? I wouldn't, yeah, I, th I think the top three are going to be the most common scenarios and going to cover most of their users. Uh, forgetting about the bottom two would, would be. I suppose, uh, an oversight because they're going to get users who are going to ask for them. But I think understanding how you would deliver it to those s slates, tablets, smartphones and deciding whether it's going to be right for your business at now and when it will be in the future I think is, is a good step. So just having that awareness of how you would do it if you wanted to I think is important. The core use case I think is going to be at least the top three. Yeah. Do you, do you agree, Andy Bus? I know you're a man who loves his smartphones. You're always there with your iPad showing people your diagrams and things like that. <laughs> But that's one thing, actually making that into some kind of virtual desktop, that's a big step, isn't it? It is, but it comes again down to if that's how users are wanting to work mm -hmm. and being able to provide them with an environment that allows them to do so in a way that's safe and secure. What, what we don't want is, is people going off and trying to do things behind the back because they can't be supported in how they'd like to work. Yeah. So are they going off and using third-party cloud services to do file distribution when you could be providing it to them through some sort of virtual desktop mechanism. Mm -hmm. So it's worth keeping an eye on it and making sure that um, you're catering for the, the use and the way that people want to work. Well, that's yeah. a good point as well. I think there are tools you can invest in in the market that will cover you in future proof you for that. Whether you turn it on at this time or not is, is up to you. But yeah, there, there are strategic investments. Yeah. And it, again, it's to make sure that, again, law of unintended consequences, that you take it into account in the long term planning. These are some of your out. unintended consequences, aren't they? Right, I see what you mean here. Yeah. Now, let's, um, let's have a look at this. Now, if, you, if you're looking at the, uh, the types of users as well, down at the bottom there, we've got people like sort of mobile professionals. Their people are very hard to provide a virtual desktop for, aren't they, Andy? Well, you'd have thought so. And a lot of people I'm do tend to think so. so. Yeah. And, uh, but the feedback we've got from the recent study is people have deployed it to them and find that they can do it successfully. So on the whole, we find that there's a lot of um, th there's not a lot of deep understanding as to what virtualization technologies can actually deliver to the desktop. So a lot of people are scared or unsure of the technologies and the suitability, and therefore think virtualization, well, that's mostly suited to transaction workers or call center. But really what we're seeing is both for high-powered workers, for mobile workers, the solutions can be put in place and be pretty successful. So it's a bit of fear, uncertainty and doubt about the capabilities and maturity of solution Matt, and experience. Matt, though, if I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a mobile professional, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just imagine for a moment that I'm a mobile professional. I'm going to Starbucks and I'm plugging in there. I'm at home. I'm in different people's offices. And yeah. Stuff. It's, I, I mean, it, it just sounds to me like creating a complicated world where a pretty simple one might possibly exist already. Yeah, you could, you could look at it in two ways. I think if you're a connected mobile professional, the examples you gave where you're always well, on, a, on an I internet mean, connection. I mean, you sort of are now. That's yeah, it. That, that's right. And, and even over 3G, you know, with, with the network coverage, um, there is opportunity to utilise the virtual desktop or the virtual work workspace environments. Um, uh, but so, it sorry, defeats... I'm sorry, are you honestly saying to me that using a 3 uh, using no, a, no, no, a notebook there's, there's a with 3G? Yeah. There's certainly a book, but yeah, I think um, it almost seems a waste of that local device. You know, if you've, if you've given somebody a couple of hundred pounds laptop that's got perhaps a new operating system, perhaps it hasn't, but it's got licences and it's got associated costs and warranties, and then everything is running in the data centre, Whilst IT may be controlling that environment more effectively and, and they've got control of the desktop, it does seem like a, uh, an extra step for that user who's perhaps traditionally used to just having everything local and they can work offline if they want to. So the, uh, there's hybrid solutions coming down the line, client hypervisors, that kind of stuff will start to address it, but uh, I think it's, it would vary from, from, use, uh, from user to user, unfortunately. Yeah. And, for example, we wouldn't be assuming that this is just a, a server-based 
remote desktop session, for example. Mm. It can very easily be uh, a full PC, and what you're doing is streaming the apps to them so yeah, that yeah. the apps are actually virtualized, but they're held in a catalog and accessible when you're offline. Mm. And the so reason to do that would be? Uh, good management, provisioning, licensing, and making sure that the latest version is up to date, for example. Yeah. So it comes back to that altruistic thing of having a more manageable desktop ecosystem mm -hmm. while trying not to impact on the flexibility and, and, and experience of the user. It's, it's about finding that right optimized desktop for that type of user, and I think the... Well, let's get, let's get into how we find those right optimized desktops for the, the users here. So. We've got uh, so we have the you know, we have some of the technology choices here mm. that you were that you were talking about. And are you saying for this that instead of looking for one particular type of virtual desktop, mm. we went through the types in the last regcast? Right. Actually, that's something you could also maybe look at. Not now. Make a note of it. The um, we were looking at the different types and the different uh, and you're saying. Use them all together, mix and yeah, match. Absolutely. The management becomes really important there. So a solution to manage all three different types and deliver the user the right desktop at yeah. the right time, uh, depending on where they're coming in from. But yeah, if, if you're trying to go down the route of all our users have to be personal virtual desktops, it will probably work, but will the ROI be as strong as if you've looked specifically at the users about what they're doing, the types of workers they are, and right-sizing that solution to them rather than shoehorning them into a certain type because you think that's the best based on you know, what you've read on the internet, for example. So, Just like in the past, we wouldn't give every user in the organization a very high-powered workstation mm -hmm. if that was what engineers required. You would actually tailor the PC to the type of use experience. So you have high performance, medium performance, and entry level. Mm -hmm. We have different solutions available in virtualization. So you can run... Uh, a very different cost structure and different performance and experience levels depending on the type of worker that's using the machine or the, the virtual desktop. So you're saying to me that there's not one that within, for example, uh, in the VDI infrastructure, for example, or app streaming or anything like that, you can't, it's not flexible enough that you can put that in place and then make sure that there are different types of users within that. That's not the right way to go. Well, the one size fits all is unlikely to be very good for everyone. Uh, so it is about choosing... You have different desktop images, isn't it? That's what you call it. Uh, well, it's different delivery mechanisms yeah. as well. So some people, some workloads may be best suited to a shared server running in the data center delivered uh -huh. to a thin client. Others may depend on what's a, what is really a, a workstation in the data center. If you're an engineering professional running high-end graphics cards, for example, with expensive licenses, um, that's a completely different cost model. And trying to get one to work for the other is often not workable. So often it's about choosing a combination of virtual desktop delivery um, for different parts of the business. So a call center may have a, a solution. Engineering may have a completely different one. Mm. Uh, Matt, this, Matt, this sounds like a nightmare. I mean, it sounds like all of a sudden, instead of just making one, well, this is called technology choices. You, yeah. you know, we've got, it's not a technology choice. It's like stick it all in there and stick mm -hmm. another management layer on the top. So you've got your, you've probably already got your ordinary desktops yep. that you're still running in parallel. Mm -hmm. Then you've got these three different types, up to three different types of virtual desktop, yep. plus management over the top of that, mm -hmm. plus the management of your existing desktops. Are, you, are you, you having to suddenly take on staff to manage this? Well, I think if, if you move from a traditional desktop estate or even retain some of that, some of that desktop estate mm. and you want to move, even if you do choose, well, I'm going to shoehorn in all of our users to, to personal virtual desktops, yeah. you're still going to maintain that, that two separate management kind of interfaces. Mm -hmm. So how we manage and provision and orchestrate the desktops and manage their profiles versus how we do that with more traditional desktop estates um, and, and deployment technologies out to the to laptops and desktops that exist. Mm. Um, it, it, is a, it is a challenge and it's a consideration that, that perhaps sometimes gets overlooked about how, how are we going to manage these in conjunction with what we're doing already on the, on the desktop. And there are ways of, of centralizing other things around patching and updating and, and application deployment's a good one. Mm -hmm. So Andy touched on uh, app streaming, application virtualization. By separating your apps from the operating system into these bubbles that can be streamed across the network, no matter where you're streaming to, a session host, a pooled virtual desktop, personal, or a local uh, desktop that's running a, on a laptop, for example, the apps 
follow the user and they stream effectively. And, and it means that you can move from one environment to another more flexibly. It does open up more doors. And the same goes for environment management, managing that profile and allowing users to flexibly move. Microsoft with roaming profiles in the box, obviously it goes some of the way, but partners like AppSense with their environment management, they offer an extra level of granularity that really does allow users to float. And if you're looking to transition over time from a traditional desktop estate to a virtual workspace of some shape or form, they allow you to do that. But I think that management layer across all of these virtualized workspaces, I think, is, is something that's important. And it's probably something that will be used more in the future than traditional desktop tools. Not everyone's agreeing with the idea that we need to mix and match here. Well, the idea that mm -hmm. we need to mix and match, they might agree with. Yeah. But with the practicality of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Not, not everyone's ready to move to a virtual environment yet, but certain areas of the business may be suited, and it's about choosing the right one then for that business. So just because, say, for example, there's a terminal server type approach, doesn't mean that that's the one you have to go for, for, say, if you want to virtualize your engineering stuff. Um, so it's about being aware of the different solutions that are available. It's not just that there is uh, a data center-based processing and you have a thin client mm. with a streaming desktop protocol. Mm. You can have local processing. You can make use of the, the machine. So be aware of what's out there and choose the, the right solution. And in fact, there's no reason why you can't actually use different technologies all together. You could have a streaming OS with streaming apps and still use a thin client terminal to access some applications. You're giving me a headache Absolutely. today. Absolutely. But let, let's not forget as well that managing the desktop environment today is a very complex and costly mm. and time-consuming initiative. We have a very distributed estate of PCs in many cases. We're told that increasingly they're notebooks, so mobile and out on the road, so you've got to support them. And yet, in a recent survey we ran, what are the most difficult things to do? Desktop management, software distribution, IT asset management and uh, license tracking, for example. So there is a whole world of pain just operating the desktop environment today. Mm -hmm. If we can centralize aspects of that and make it more efficient by, by taking the management on board, and maybe this is a journey, not just something that's available today, but we can start moving. So long as we can provide the flexibility of experience, we can start to actually take some of that pain away by introducing the, the concept of virtualization. So, so maybe a, the, if it is a journey, Matt, one of the steps on the journey is to say, OK, we can use this technology for these people mm. and we'll just concentrate on them for the minute rather than, sort of as this slide might suggest, sort yeah. of dropping th three different yeah, yeah, just types like three, of technology yeah, on the whole organization Absolutely. all of a sudden. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's a choice. And I think if you look at session virtualization, it's mature, but it's, it's not going to meet every need. It's not going to be a power user's tool. It's not, going to be, it's not going to suit every application. So having that understanding that what it can and can't do and how it can model to certain users I think is important. And yeah, phasing those, if they're the right technology for you over time, is the right thing to do. And you could just go out all out virtual desktops, but typically the return on that, the densities you'll achieve, will typically be less than a session-based environment. But you know, it's a consideration to make. Before we get on to particular user cases, there's a couple of questions so we need to clear up. First one is, this complicates, um, this complicates licensing, doesn't it? I think, yeah, I think virtual desktops uh, does complicate it. And it how can we simplify that again? That's the thing. Yeah, I think, I think the thing is, and <laughs> the problem is with licensing, is that people are wanting to do things with technology now, and the licensing can't keep up quick enough. It can't change and adapt to suit what people want to do based on what people have done before. So, you know, we, we've created licensing schemes that, that fit with what people wanted to do a couple of years ago, and now the technology's moved so quickly, and we've tried to evolve it as, as quickly as possible, but it's, it's not always fitting. But, yeah, the, the licensing is, is more complex, both from Microsoft and from partners who sit on top and offer yeah. extra services and, and techno. There's, there's so much to think about now. It is a very, very difficult kind of time and a challenge, I think, for a lot of organizations. How would you deal with that if that one's going to be the hold-up? Because also, I mean, that makes it slightly opaque how much you're going to pay for this. Yeah, I mean, the licensing, how, how would I deal with that? It's, it's one of those costs that, that obviously needs to get factored into the bigger project. And, and wait. if you're moving away from a traditional desktop estate, the costs move, and it does move to a more of a subscription model, which I think a lot of cloud services are starting to push. So it's that acceptance of perhaps a subscription-based model for, for things like virtual desktops. Um, but it, it, it's a tricky conversation because it's a, it's a changing cost. I mean, if you were paying twice in terms of you'd pay to license your Windows clients and then you were connecting and not using the power of them 
to connect to a virtual desktop, then then yeah, you know that's a, that's a cost you you perhaps look to eliminate on the on the desktop side. So, mm. and this is where technologies like app streaming may start to help as well, because if you can actually track who's using an application, how often, which applications aren't used, and are just shelfware. Mm -hmm. You can actually optimize parts of your licensing as well. Yeah. So you can try to start to get a handle rather than over provisioning to whole groups of workers. You can actually pay for actually what's used and have a much stronger base of information when it comes to negotiation time. So when you're renegotiating the licenses, you can cut support for what you don't need. You can cut down apps that you don't and also ramp up the apps that you do. Three words here, right? Client based hypervisor madness. Um, I think. <laughs> I think the client-based hypervisor, or client-side hypervisor, yeah. I think is, is one of those things, it's almost an extra section on our slide in terms of it's another, it's another option, it's another choice. You know, what, what we've got today for mobile professionals that we, we, we talked about before, um, those types of users today it would be a waste of that device if we just used them to connect to a, a virtual desktop. But having the client-based hypervisor gives us opportunity for bring your own PC. It bring, gives us opportunity for them, them secure, isolated environments running locally and almost a check-in and check-out type process as well. But they're just another consideration. It doesn't make it it's any definitely easier. Definitely not for anyone, for everyone, just to sort of like throw into the mix on top of it. Yeah, just like any of these, any of the sessions, the pool, the personal, they're not, they're not just for any type of user. You've got to really look at the user and That's the use case. Then let's get on to these. First of all, a, a, a technology thing here, your remote FX uh, technology. What, what's the point of this? I was saying before to you, it's something that when it's explained to me, I go, oh, yeah, and then I forget about it two minutes later. Yeah. I'm, I've, gone, I've gone blank again. What's remote <laughs> FX for? This will, yeah, so, so remote FX is a technology, and we were talking about the user experience mm -hmm. as being really important and you know, could spell the, the, a failed project. Remote FX is a capability that's built into Hyper-V, uh, the virtualization platform, uh, Service Pack 1 for R2, so it's, it's just been released. Now, when you're specking up hardware to run virtual desktops, the last thing you really think about is, do I need a graphics card in that server? You think about RAM, you think about CPU, disk, all that, the usual stuff. Mm. Now we're starting to see this desire for high-end graphical virtual desktops, and it doesn't exist today. But with remote effects, what we're aiming to do is provide the ability for a virtual desktop to hook on and share the physical graphics power that you've put into the into the host, so a single graphics card, multiple graphics cards, or a chassis of graphics cards. Is, is this a special type of graphics card? Uh, well, they're, they're from uh, our partners AMD and, uh, and NVIDIA, and they're, they're, at the moment the certified ones are the higher-end mm -hmm. uh, Quadros and the Fire Pro type graphics cards, so professional graphics cards at this stage. But what they're doing is, just like virtual desktops share uh, CPU and they share memory, they'll also share the graphics card. But exposed now to the virtual machine is true 3D capability, so OpenGL, DirectX. And it, and it may not tick every box for, for the high-end graphics designer who's using every feature of what would be normally a local graphics card, but it's certain, certainly a step in the, in the right direction to provide the richest, media-rich graphic experience for a virtualized environment. I noticed we've got a couple of questions already from people saying, love to go this way, mm -hmm. but uh, as one guy was saying, his marketing team needs that full, rich environment. Yeah. And so this sounds like th this is a sort of step towards that. Yeah, that's right. For, for designers or people using CAD or people doing video rendering and that kind of stuff. And it's a very clever technology, but it's also got a really strong partner ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So one of the key considerations about remote effects is it's a LAN-based technology with pure Microsoft technology. So your latency needs to be less than 20 milliseconds. If you want to start extending this out over the WAN, where people are connecting from Starbucks and from home, then we need to work with our partners like Citrix, Quest, Ericom, who have better protocols over the WAN than we do. So you've got a remote effects enabled rich desktop, and how you get there is enhanced through partner solutions. So unless you get that latency down, then this remote FX graphics capability, that's not really going to... Not, not, on, not on pure Microsoft technology. With partner technology, you've got, more, you've got a lot more leeway with the latency. Um, mm -hmm. Other considerations to make, you know, the, the, the number of graphics cards or the amount of video RAM you've got in that server yeah. is ultimately going to determine the density. So a remote FX desktop isn't going to be for every single user. But that goes back to the scenarios we've been, we've been kind of addressing and, and will continue to address where it's about looking at what the user does, 
and what they need and giving them the right tool. But it's, a, it's another tick in the box for... for, for uh, and you need a server that you can stick a graphics card in. Absolutely, yeah. But what we're seeing is even the really thin blade servers that you think a GPU this big is never going to fit in there. Mm. The OEMs and the graphics card vendors are working together to Very, very thin Very, very cards. thin. You know, microscopic, you know, really, really small uh, graphics cards that, that work and are optimised, low power, but high performance. And, and as I said, that partner ecosystem, both at the back end, and thin client vendors, for example, are producing remote effects enabled uh, uh, thin client devices so that the rendering and the, the performance is really, really rich. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very, very high end solution for virtualizing Windows 7. Okay, let's put the, you, you put together four um, appropriate desktops for us. So, let's, let's have a look at those. Um, we can also see maybe where the, you know, the technologies that we've been talking about, yeah. where they fit into those and where they don't. So the first one is the obvious one, is it's call center environment, what everyone has always thought about when it comes to virtual desktops. Because, yeah. well, there you are. They don't need very much stuff, and they don't need it to be very no. good. And, it's, and a call center desktop, it, it, it's typically function over style. You know, they don't need the graphic, the whizzy graphics and the cool stuff. And, but more and more, they're getting more of a requirement for rich media. Maybe it's some trainings delivered over Flash or, or Windows Media or, or whatever. And the, the devices that might, may have been sat on their desk using quite a lot of power for a long period of time may not be up to that. So we need to think about how we can move forward in the future without giving them a ridiculously super-powered PC, but how we can centralise and, and deliver a, a richer environment that's relevant to that type of user. You know, what we don't want to say is, well, we're going to just roll out virtual desktops for everyone for the sake of it and say that's, that's the answer for you and you're going to have a really high-end desktop even though you don't necessarily need it. So the call centre scenario is something that would be typically uh, solved by something like a, a session-based environment where you've got a, a large number of users condensed down onto a, a server, so you're getting a lot of density, which means the returns are good. You could say, oh, we'll give them a virtual desktop instead to, to simplify things. But typically with session virtualization, your level of density per host is higher than it would be for virtual desktops. So therefore, you'd need more hosts for virtual desktops, therefore more cost of infrastructure and warranties and, what, and whatnot. So that's the argument for that choices slide we, we talked about before, yeah. is it's thinking about those kind of factors. So whilst the management might be that little bit more tricky, the densities are higher and the cost and the return is, is, is much better. So um, with a session-based environment configured and made to look like Windows 7, the environment they're using on their home PCs, or it's local Windows 7, when they come in, well, it looks pretty similar, actually. It's a server, but it's made to look and feel like a, a Windows 7 desktop. So, and with remote effects, it can still enhance the, the, the session-based environment, not, kind of, not in the same way as it does for virtual desktops, but it still does enhance the, uh, the user experience and increase the density as well. So. But session-based for this sort of thing? I, I would lead with that. Normally, if I'm discussing with partners and customers, um, the session-based environment does work well for that type of user. It's not going to fit every organization, but it certainly does give a good return. And it's mature, and people understand how it's licensed. You could use a pooled virtual desktop where people just get divvied out at a certain desktop at a certain time, but, uh, and that would be perhaps equally effective. And if you've got certain apps that don't work in a session-based environment, yeah. pooled virtual desktops would work well for them as well. So, again, it's a choice. It depends on the environment and the app and the, the users. Right idea, Randy Buss? I, I would tend to agree. Um, I think that whole session-based approach is mature and accepted now and is one of the, the predominant forms and, in fact, has been used in a lot of call center and I mean, that's one of the things in its advantage, isn't it? It's mm. been around for a while. It is, and it's fairly well understood. As you say, the licensing is there. The management is mostly there. But we've got some challenges. So what happens when we move to things like um, voice communications, mm. where you've got IP running over the, the network? Can that run in the session environment? Has it got enough processing power? And can it handle the, the codecs? Or do you then need to have a hybrid solution where you've got an, a local app Doing the, the you're center. asking me questions, Andy. So, uh, I, I, want, I want answers. This I, is, I don't know. This, the, the, these are all the, uh, the the types of things we need to think Maybe about. Maybe Matt can answer this. I think the VoIP one is, is really tricky because yeah. it's so live and communication. And, and even if you have a normal VoIP environment where it's a poor call, you notice you know, where you're waiting around, and and that's only going to be amplified by a a remote working environment. If you're on the LAN, it's going to be amplified less. But on the WAN, if you are expecting that same level of of uh, experience, I think. On its own, RDP, it's, it's just not going to happen. I don't, I don't think it's suitable for that. 
partner technology from Citrix, Quest and the like, they're accelerating all of the time. So I think if it's going to be possible, it's going to be possible through, through those Because it's a difficult decision to make if it closes off the possibilities to, you know, if, if you're moving towards a sort of unified communications environment, yeah. for example. Yeah, that's right. If it right. closes that off to you, then... In the exactly, that's, that's right. And that's where a local environment that's well managed is perhaps sometimes a better solution for that. Okay. Let's have a look at our, our, our number two here on the uh, scenario two, which is the mobile professional. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of them about. Like I say, when I go to Starbucks, mm -hmm. they've taken all the good seats. Yep. You know, they're on the sofas, <laughs> using, their, uh, using their laptops, uh, having their meetings, using Windows XP. I think in a lot of cases, I think uh, a lot of organizations still run XP. It's been around for a long time. But I think they're, the, the things they're perhaps using on their home PC or the kind of peripherals and uh, different technologies they're using to supplement their work experience, their working experience, I think XP doesn't always support all of those. You know, new standards, new uh, peripherals that perhaps aren't getting the drivers for XP. So what we're seeing now is, is a push towards Windows 7. It's the decision for IT is how do we get this particular type of user to Windows 7. Do we virtualize it and just strip down this XP laptop and, and sweat the asset for a bit longer and let them use it as a connectivity tool, mm -hmm. um, which is an option, and it would be a, a wise option in terms of sweating that asset for a little bit longer. But going forward, I think the solution for this type of user doesn't necessarily always fit with a virtualized workplace, a session or, or virtual desktop. I think what actually the, the big benefit of a, a mobile professional who requires offline working capability is either the client hypervisor, which I think will mature as we go forward, or it's something like a local Windows 7 with some of the features that exist within Windows 7 that streamline the user experience. Direct access, simplifying how we can get back into the office and get to our information. Search and the, the, uh, the support of new and upcoming standards and applications. But as Andy said before, that app virtualization can really complement it. By removing all of the installed stuff, and just streaming and caching applications mm -hmm. means that if we ever lose this, la this laptop or it gets stolen and, and we've got encryption technology on there as well, if we ever lose it, then reprovisioning is very quick because we deliver an image to the device and then when the user logs in, the apps are streamed. So it becomes ease of management going forward as well, but it can be complemented. It's not ne uh, necessary to do that, but it can be complemented. But I think the, the solution for a mobile worker, again, it's going to depend on different organisations, but certainly it's... Uh, it's uh, easier, I think, to roll out a, a localised desktop. I guess only this becomes more urgent now with more uh, what we call mobile workers. They're just people who are working from home a couple of days a week. Well, the, some of them are just working from home, but there is a huge growth at the moment in notebooks and mm. sort of flexible working and also working on the road. And what's happened is people are actually taking apps and data outside the organisation without necessarily having a security policy put in place to control it. Yeah. So one of the ways we can think of helping is maybe certain apps are delivered in a, uh, in a thin client window running on the PC so that the app runs in the data center with security. The data never leaves. It does mean you need the connectivity to connect, but there's a lot more connectivity these days. So m maybe their main productivity apps are local or their, their main documents, but the sensitive apps and data remain in the data center. Mm -hmm. That's just one use of some virtualization technologies to help the, the whole usage experience. Mm -hmm. And the other side is this whole app virtualization. So having a catalog of apps available, being able to use it when, when needed, and have it either streamed over the connection or actually cached. So in many cases, we can cache a whole library of apps. And then when it's used, it's reported back. And you can, at the end of the year, tally up your license usage and uh, um, work out what you've actually need to pay for. <laughs> what you've actually spent. <laughs> <laughs> have a shock and have your hair oh, turn yeah. wide. M Matt, is this, um, is that as for app virtualization, is that, um, is it a, 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 an elegant solution to a, a business problem or is it a bit of a fudge? No, I think, it, I think it is an elegant solution because the flexibility it gives you is it, it separates those apps from the OS, which means any future upgrades to the OS or any future strategies you may have about moving between physical desktops, virtualized, and so on, becomes that bit easier because you've moved them away and, and you've got the compatibility there. So if you want to go from Windows 7 to Windows 8, you've know, got the ability to just redirect the applications with a little bit of testing, obviously, to yeah. the new platform. Hang on, if we're just going to Windows 7 now. Well, that's, this is true, yeah. but it, it, it's not going to be that far away. But with sure. the separation, it's going to give people that flexibility to move if the features and functions are applicable to them. There are, it's a tough nut to crack, this one, the mobile so worker is, one, yeah, isn't it is. it? is this something that, in your experience, a lot of people are leaving 
in the too hard basket when we're talking about the uh, virtual desktop? Um, from a mobile professional perspective, I think uh, they're the ones we're seeing least, although yeah. certainly when I'm engaging with partners and, and customers, they're, they're the ones that are the kind of last to do because there are other technologies we can put in first that, that make it easier, like yeah. the apps and stuff. And as, as Andy said, you know, put in a, keeping the corporate apps in the data center, maybe you've got a client server app that you want to, the client and the server bit to run in the data center where it's nice and quick and you just see a view of it on your local machine rather than from your laptop all the way to the, to the data center. So it's, it's um, yeah, they can be complemented and, and the separation of profiles and apps can really make future directions more, more simple. Isn't it a, a, an interesting one? While we're on this, while we're talking about the, di uh, the, um, uh, the, the choice between basically using local apps and, mm. um, and, and having them streamed, uh, rule of thumb, do you need more processor power, more uh, more memory no if you're virtualizing then no the applications just run as if they're local they're just separated into into effectively like bubbles um, and the beauty of those is they don't conflict with one another so if you run if you've got a reason to run multiple versions of say access on the same device you can't install that unless you go you know, around the uh, back door mm -hmm. streaming them and caching them on the device allows them to run at the same time on the same device okay. but can you run internet explorer 6 not with app v but there are other technologies that will allow you to do that yeah good question <laughs> See, you should be on the other side asking the questions. I like yours. Now, okay, the uh, scenario three, the office worker. So, uh, you, so this is not that. This is someone who uses lots of different things, a little bit more flexibility than your yeah. our task worker in scenario one. Yeah. And uh, these are not to characterise them unfairly. A lot of the people that kick up a big fuss. Yeah, potentially. Uh, they're not necessarily all power users, but they no. certainly have a range of applications, line of business, and perhaps things like the office suite. Uh, they do use rich media, which is a key consideration, maybe YouTube when they're browsing on their lunch or whatever, if they're allowed to do that, and video to, to consume for different types of uh, content. But they've come to expect uh, a, a rich user experience. Typically, they're in the office, but sometimes they'll go home. And if IT have enabled them to do that and access their information, how do we manage that, how do we control that, and how do we optimise it going forward? But typically those environments have desktops under the, under the uh, desk, uh, and they're running typically XP and, and perhaps legacy office. It's a funny business where we say they've got desktops under the desk. And, uh, you know. <laughs> I didn't really correct myself, but I thought that's uh, right. Uh, you know, I, yes, but I mean, you are actually right. But though, anyway, there we go. So this, uh, this is what you recommend for these guys. Yeah, I think, I think for those type of users, because perhaps some of their applications that they're running will determine that a session-based environment isn't right because they won't run in that environment, mm. then a pooled or a personal desktop may be applicable. And, and we had the discussion earlier around, well, which one would you give, a personal or a pooled? And again, it's, it's going to come down to that user and that, in, that environment specifically. How do you make that decision? I think you, you have to weigh up a pooled environment. You're going to have to be more clever about how you manage profiles. So it's an extra consideration to make. Mm. Maybe out-of-the-box roaming profiles, maybe partners like AppSense would, would help you there. If it's personal, you could treat it like you've just moved the desktop into the data center and yeah. you just manage it in the same way. It's, that's up to you. Whether it needs to be remote effects enabled or not will, is determined by their use of rich media and how rich that experience needs to be. You could get away with a non-remote effects virtual desktop if need be. But certainly that centralization for that type of user is, is, a, is a key uh, possibility, I think, for them. Yeah, and, and this, this, this is a whole thing numbers, of applications. It? Yeah. yeah. It, it's working out what people actually use. So do you have a standardized image that people just log into with apps everywhere? Uh, or do you stream the apps or do you actually stream the OS? And this is where, for example, the hypervisor... You're asking me questions again. Give again. me answers. So if, if we're looking at it, what, we, what we're what we really looking at enabling is things like hot desking. So mm -hmm. being able to just go to any desk and literally log in with your personal environment. And so what you need to think about is getting those apps that are necessary delivered, configured, in exactly the way that the user expects. Not changing every time they log into a new machine. Mm -hmm. Not having to think, I have to configure my environment or I have to download an app and get it to work. So these are some of the challenges. And some of the ways to work is, can, you can actually stream a whole OS. So if you're holding the image in the data center and someone logs in, you can run a whole virtual OS down to the, the environment. Or you can use tools just to make sure that the apps and the data and settings follow the user. Mm. Um, but no one solution is right. It will all depend on the circumstance and what you're needing to achieve. Let's, get, let's make sure that we, have, uh, we get on to our power users, because they're the ones that cause a lot of problems mm. 
here. So, you know, take us through the who do we identify as power users in this scenario? So, the power users are the people who are really IT savvy in the environment. They know how to perhaps tweak and tailor the operating system A to their needs and B to get the most performance out of it. Mm. So, they've really built this environment that is very personal to them. They know how it works, and if something goes wrong, they'll not contact IT, they'll try and fix it themselves. And these power users, they'll run perhaps uh, a lot of line of business apps and, and powerful applications, maybe for graphic design and whatnot, but they might also run untrusted applications from, from the IT department. So we've got to factor that into how we manage that device. Um, we've also got the ability to um, manage their environment, their applications, and, and that's, again, something we really want to think about. And, and they might want to work from home. You know, they may want to work out and about because I'm a power user. I should be able to access that desktop the same as it was when it was in the office. And Again, the, the virtual desktop is really, is really suited to that. It's, yeah. it's, obviously, it's power user slash contractor, so somebody who might not work for you, they may have a really powerful PC that's theirs, but it's untrusted in your environment. So you might think, well, actually, rather than you put all of our apps on your machine that we don't manage, we'll give you a virtual desktop. And it's ours. We control how you access it. We'll give you everything you need in it to do your job effectively, but we're putting that security boundary in between your untrusted device and our trusted network, which is the virtual desktop. Uh, and that, that works really well, I think. And a personal desktop for that type of user, where they can change the wallpaper, they can tweak the OS. And if it does get uh, a little bit run down and it starts to conflict and, and they've, perhaps not, they've perhaps tweaked something incorrectly, it's easy to provision again from the gold image. So that's the beauty of the virtual desktop, is it's very quick to replace should things go a bit wayward. And you're dealing with customers on this. Are they going for this? Because in the past, they've turned it down flat. You know what, personal virtual desktops are probably the easiest because it is a natural move from um, we've got a personal laptop or desktop here, now we've got a personal machine there. Don't have to worry about profiles, the state is part of that desktop. So that's the easiest move. It's the move to the pooled virtual desktop where stuff is reprovisioning itself and, mm. and um, on log off and profiles become a, a consideration because, well, I'm, I'm out of control in terms of I can't get to desktop A that was in yesterday. Now I'm in desktop B, out of my hands as a user. My profile's not there. What's, you know, I can't access my work. You know? Profiles becomes the real linchpin for that, and that is often something that potentially comes further down the line. It depends on, on the particular project. But. Just, a, just a quick one on that. Pete's asked, um, is it possible to set up multiple pools of pooled desktops in VDI? Multiple pools of pooled desktops. I don't, I don't understand what he's asking. Yeah, so, yeah, that's right. So you could have a pool that's Windows 7, right. you could have a pool that's Windows 7 SP1, you could uh -huh. have a pool that's... And, right. and, what, and how you make them available to different users is largely determined by the management I software you're using. Yeah, yeah, so pools of pools. That's, po that, that's possible. Yeah, that, absolutely, If yeah. you want to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's perfectly possible, yeah. So, with, for example, Zen Desktop, Quest V Workspace, those kind of management tools will make that all possible for you. Okay. Pools of pools. I don't know if you can do pools of pools of pools, but... Maybe someone could have a go and let us know <laughs> when you finish, uh, or not. If we don't no. hear from you, we assume that you can't. Um, so, uh, just to, uh, to finish off, a couple of next steps here. Are, is there anything particular that you would pull out, Matt? Yeah, to... something that's not on there is is the the IPD guide, the infrastructure planning. You're, you're saying planning something that's guide. not on here now. Yeah, just to, just to the supplement IPD it. guide. Yeah, yeah, the IP infrastructure planning design for the optimized with a Z, unfortunately, yeah. desktop. Um, and that will help you ask some of the questions. It doesn't cover everything, but it's a good starter. So that's a good diagnosis. For yeah, yeah. Just which of these things that think you might about? want to be, to be looking yeah, it's, at? Yeah, it's a nice matrix that says, okay, if most of my users fit into this office worker, these yeah. technologies will be suitable. And by no means perfect, but it's a good kind of indicator. And uh, Andy, just uh, to finish off on this, there is a lot of planning work to be done when you're moving to this kind of environment, isn't there? And that's something you know we've only just started on it here. There absolutely is, but also a lot of education. So a lot of the perceived wisdom of what virtualization is about has changed over the last two years. There's a whole spectrum of new technologies available, and it's understanding what those do. So our advice would be don't rush into it, but be aware of all the options and choose the right solution for the right user group. Trying to fit one size to everyone is likely to result in tears long term. OK. Well, it's, um, we hope... That we've tried, that we've clarified some of those options, uh, you know, and helped with that today. So uh, let us know if we have or if we haven't on the feedback. Thanks for all your questions today. I tried to get through as many of them as possible. There were quite a few today. Quite pleased with that. And um, please let us know uh, what you like to see on our Regcast in the future. And uh, thank you very much to Matt. Matt, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Know, it's a lot of a lot of information today. I was worried you wouldn't get through it, but you did. Just about. Yeah, I was talking quickly sometimes. <laughs> And uh, Andy, thank you very much. That's as a always. pleasure, Tim. And I've been Tim Phillips, and so from our latest Regcast, goodbye.